Good morning, everyone. As James said, I'm Stephanie Frischi. I hail from Indiana and uh, a little bit west of West Lafayette, where Purdue is. But I'm I'm an agronomist and native plant materials specialist with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, and I'm glad to join you here at the Conservation Tillage and Technology Conference. This morning I'll be I'll be talking. I guess I should mention there's a few differences in in the program. Like I I don't hail from Wisconsin. I'm not sure how that got in there. And uh, we're not going to be managing beneficials for pollinators. We're going to be talking about managing cover crops for beneficial insects and and pollinators. Uh, learn a little bit more about their biology, their identification, so what they are. Um, what they do and what a bug needs and how we can provide that. Um, and then after we go through some of those descriptive parts about the insects of interest, we'll talk about different management practices. I'm excited to say I, I won't be going into it today, but we are developing more publications and short courses on soil invertebrates. Uh, as part of our new initiative in soil health with insects. And then I'll, I'll wrap up things here with uh, some more resources. And, and what's being passed around is just a general brochure for plans uh, in conjunction with NRCS or separately from NRCS. Myself and, and our other Xerces staff in the Midwest can work with you to develop a habitat plan for either pollinators or beneficial insects or both on your farm. So that's what's being passed around there. And uh, at the end, here's, here's what I hope that, that we all get to talk about and take home with us today. The essential message that diversity begets diversity. So the more diversity you have as, as far as cover crop species, crop species, the permanent habitat around your uh, annual farm fields, the coyotes, the foxes, all those natural predators, whether they're uh, predating voles or when we get into talking about the, the insect predators that are attacking some of our pest insects. Uh, all that diversity is something we want to try to focus and encourage in our farmland. And then that diversity also covers the whole, whole year, every season. So beneficial insects need their needs met for every stage or season. They, don't, they may disappear, they may stop um, feeding, but they're, they don't migrate. They're still always in our fields and in this area all year long, so learning about their biology will help us understand what they need at each stage of their life. They also need protection from pesticides. We can do a lot to provide them habitat in terms of food and shelter, but if we're still just adding pesticides to the environment, we're going to be undoing all that good we've tried to build. And then uh, this is, I think, an issue for us here in corn and soybean country. We just we do have a lot of annual crops in our farming systems, and so wherever we can, it's important to create and maintain some permanent habitat and cover on the farm edges, along ditches, along um, if you still have a fence row. <laughs> that, that's something else about these the predator perches for hawks and owls that James was talking about. We used to have more more fence rows and more tree lines, and all those trees, whether they were living or or even a dead tree, makes an excellent perch for for a lot of those predatory birds. So um, if you have a chance to keep, keep some trees here and there on your farm, that's a good habitat suggestion as well. All right, I'll make this a little bit interactive as well, and I'm going to try to take a break about halfway through to pause for questions, but if you want to ask anything along the way, please speak up. And I want to ask you a few questions to begin with. Where, where are you with cover crops? Kind of between skeptic and convert. You might be somewhere in the middle. You might be skeptic and convert all at the same time. Uh, who here is, is newer to cover crops? Can you raise your hand? Great. OK, a few of you. And who here is, has a few years of experience now, and you feel a little more on the 
higher on the comfort level. All right, great. And then uh, another question here. I'm assuming corn and soybeans, but are there any of you growing other crops beyond that? Anyone? Back there? What do you grow? Wheat, oat, rye, barley. Anything else? Was that alfalfa? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Sunflower. All right. Great. So a lot of these things come together. You, you, may be, you may have started doing cover crops for conservation ag or soil health practices, but uh, they're, they're all related here, preventing soil erosion, increasing water filtration, increasing soil organic matter, decrease compaction, manage nutrients, biofumigation is also what James was talking about, some of the brassicas and mustards and radish. Those have those sulfur compounds that can impact um, some pest groups. And then um, weed suppression, either the cover crops are helping to smother weeds and you're also supporting the insects or small mammals that are consuming weed seeds there. In general though, cover crops can also be used to support integrated pest management and reduce inputs of chemical fertilizer and pesticides. Uh, it's a lot more of a, a complex system, as, as many of you all understand very well. And then what I'd like to focus on today is, is supporting pest predators, the parasitoids, and pollinators, and soil life in general. A bit about the Xerces Society. I, our photo's not displaying there the whole way, but that's our staff, <laughs> the top, the heads of a few there. Sorry that photo's not displaying correctly. But um, we are named, Xerxes is a little bit of a weird word, I know. It's um, Xerxes or Xerxes or Xerxes, any of those pronunciations are fine. This is a, a tiny type of butterfly called the Xerxes blue butterfly. And in the 1950s, it went extinct. It, its habitat was out near San Francisco, and there was military development that happened there on, it, on its habitat. And that butterfly was lost forever due to human activity. The first butterfly to go extinct in North America due to human activity. So Xerxes was really formed in a response to that, to try to prevent more uh, insect extinctions from happening in the future. And now we are actually an, an organization that does a lot more beyond butterfly conservation. We have about 50 staff. The main office is out in Portland, Oregon, but there are our staff in about 15 different states, and, and I'm in Indiana. We also have staff in, in Iowa and um, New Jersey, so a bit here in the, the Midwest and Great Lakes. And the focus of our work currently is, is in all these different areas on pollinators, on enhancing and encouraging agricultural biodiversity, understanding pesticide risk and trying to mitigate that. Again, within some endangered species, um, aquatic invertebrates like the mussel pictured here, and then newer efforts in urban conservation and working on policy and advocacy for these groups. Xerxes also is an excellent source of really uh, publications that translate science into practice. So our website is xerxes.org and there's a tab on there that says resources and you can get these as print publications or almost all of them are available as free PDF downloads if you'd like to do that. If you are interested in getting a, a hard copy that's of uh, publication quality, instead of just printing it yourself, you can email pollinators at xerces.org to request that. And specific to this talk today, if you haven't seen this, this was produced by, this, by SARE, and uh, this is cover cropping for beneficial insects and pollinators. Uh, it's just a, what, eight page publication here, but that's one I highly recommend taking a look at. 
And then this one is habitat planning for beneficial insects. And this is a Xerces publication that's just a few years old. And I, I wish we could just go through this book today. So I have a few pages I'll show from this, but um, I highly recommend it. It'll go through the main groups of beneficial insects. It talks about what they eat at which life stage and sort of where to find them in the soil or on the plants and how to recognize them. So getting into a bit more about the biology and ecology, beneficial insects are um, typically grouped into um, their predators. This is the green lacewing, both the larva and the adults are pretty voracious predators. A lot of the beetles, um, the adults may or may not be predators, but certainly the larva are predators. And then many types of wasps are parasitoids. And what that means is that this, whoop, the adult here, she's picking up and killing uh, a caterpillar that then she will take back to her nest or lay eggs on. And when those eggs hatch, the wasp larva feed on that dead caterpillar body. So that's a loving mother, um, if, if ever there was one. And then this is a, another type of lacewing larva. This is one of the, the lady beetle larva here eating a small caterpillar. And then also a lot of flies have that same behavior where they lay their eggs very near to other larvae that are going to hatch, and the, the fly larva will feed on other insect larva. And just to recap what conservation biocontrol is, in, instead of introducing a predatory or beneficial insect from, say, another continent, uh, conservation biocontrol really focuses on supporting the natural ecosystem and building habitat that supports the natural pests that are already in your area. In many cases, beneficial insects are going to overlap a lot with pollinators. So sometimes I'll be talking about them as separate groups, but a lot of time what I say about one applies to the other. And uh, when we talk about pollinators, of course, bat, bats and hummingbirds are some of the the vertebrates, mammals, and birds, which pollinate flowers. But of course, the great, great majority of, of pollinators are insects, and those fall into six main groups. Butterflies and moths, those adults feed on nectar. Beetles, also a lot of the adults feed on pollen and nectar. Flies, the adults are feeding on pollen and nectar, whereas the, the larvae are probably feeding on other insects. Um, oops, this was the moth here. Butterfly, moths, flies, this is the beetle. And then we have wasps. Again, the adults are feeding on flowers for the nectar and pollen. And then here's a, a picture representing bees, which are also, of course, feeding on, on pollen and nectar as both adults and larvae. So our, our crop plants, of course, a lot of our, our grasses are wind pollinated. So um, those don't rely on insects for pollination, but the um, things like soybeans and, of course, sunflowers, if you're growing alfalfa for seed, all of those types of crops require pollination. And just in general, of all the hundreds of thousands of, of plants in the world, 85% of those require some type of animal pollination to complete their life cycle and form seeds. And, and pollinators don't just do pollination. They're benefiting the plants because they, they um, help them with their reproduction. But then those seeds become food for more wildlife. Uh, if you are a, a bird hunter and you're trying to raise pheasant or quail on your land, you may focus a lot on seeds because that's what the adults are eating. But what those young chicks really need to grow up on are insects. So having a lot of habitat um, for, for birds doesn't just mean seeds and cover, it means insects as well. And then um, this is 
not in Ohio, but bears, they also really rely on insects and pollinators. A lot of their life, they're eating fruits and berries, and those fruits and berries are the result of insect pollination. And when bears are eating salmon or fish like that, of course, those salmon were eating aquatic insects as, as their food source. So even animals as big as, as grizzly bears depend on pollinators. But as we're understanding the, the importance of pollinators for our Earth systems, there's also just new studies out almost every week or every day uh, documenting the decline and loss of pollinators and the services that they provide. And there are, are four main threats or causes behind both pollinator decline and insect decline in general, and that is habitat loss, pesticide use, um, the disease or non and non-native species and the impact that those have on pollinators, and then climate change and more variable weather patterns. This is a, a slide I like to throw in here. This is based on USDA data, and if we look at these colors, the, the yellow is uh, pasture or range. If you took kind of all the areas of the United States that are used for pasture or range and, and set them together in a group, that's, that's how many of the western states they would cover. Green are our forested lands that are managed for timber. The brown are our um, crops and farm fields. The blue are areas like our national parks and military lands. Those are fairly natural areas. Uh, gray is miscellaneous, which might be things like cemeteries or golf courses. And then pink is the urban or the built uh, and paved environment. So if we look at that, we really see that um, what might be considered wild is just here. And really what we are managing for production, this green, yellow and brown area covers so much of our, our land area and so conservation practices are really critical in those areas as well. This is, is that same data just displayed a bit differently and if we look at, at the yellow, you can see most of that is for cattle and then even the brown. Um, here's just the part of that, of cropland that provides food for humans. Here's the part that's providing feed for livestock. Here's our biofuels part. Uh, some of that's idle or fallow. Uh, just to, to give a, another idea of how we're using our land in the United States. And a lot of our farmland is not always very good habitat because um, many, many months of the year it looks like this. So we've converted a lot of our grasslands and forest into farmland and by, by trying to be efficient, we've simplified and intensified that. And we have larger expanses of monocultures, we have cleaner fields, cleaner fence rows, uh, and edges, margins, borders, and ditches. This will follow up nicely with what James was saying about pesticide use. This is a video, I'm not sure if this will do you in the back know if you can run that? Please? Yep. So it's up there on the TV screen, but this is showing uh, glyphosate use and sort of with the advent of Roundup Ready technology, how we all started using a lot more glyphosate. So as the colors get darker, that's measured in pounds per acre. So pounds per acre is is increasing in intensity as well as in coverage. Thank you for running that, that's good. Then looking at insecticides, specifically imidacloprid, which is one of those neonicotinoid types of insecticides. That as well, I don't have a time sequence to show you here, but again here in our, our uh, Midwestern Corn Belt and other areas, we're, we're just using more and more um, pounds per square mile here. And neonicotinoids are, are a less bad pesticide because they have less of an impact on mammals. They're more specific to insects. 
so so that's been something I think behind that's pr that they've been promoted as. Uh, they're also easy to package and deliver as seed coatings, but that's led them to also just be very very pervasive in in farming today. So this is backing up and looking at an endangered insect. We have a bumblebee, which is a federally endangered species here in the Midwest. The rusty patched bumblebee. It was just named. Uh, as an endangered species about two years ago. And this map, if you can see the outline, is where it occurred historically. And you have these black dots, which is where it was before the year 2006. And from 2006 to 2012, it was really observed much less frequently. And then specific searches have been done for it and are not finding a lot. It's interestingly holding on well in cities like Chicago and Milwaukee and, and Minneapolis, but certainly now that it's listed as an endangered species, there's a lot of efforts underway to help recover it. And um, its decline also seems to be tied to this neonicotinoid use over its range. Just as a, a reminder or a refresher, insects have two types of, two main types of metamorphosis. Um, there are some that, that live their life cycle by going through incomplete metamorphosis. So the eggs hatch and the young look essentially like tinier versions of the adults. And they typically have the same type of food source throughout all those growth stages. And then the other type of metamorphosis is called complete metamorphosis, and that's where eggs are laid, and then larvae hatch. And larvae often are feeding on a different type of food um, than what the adult is feeding on. And then this intermediary stage is the pupa or the chrysalis, um, which is where the larva then transforms into the adult. This is the, the same slide showing those six types of, of pollinator groups and again some of the main beneficial insect groups. And if we look at those a little more closely, so flies, um, they're, they're very diverse. And again, they have different larva, different diets between the larva and the adults. So adults are feeding on nectar and pollen. You'll see adult flies on the flowers. But the larvae are, are what we're interested in as far as beneficial insects. Um, they're eating other insects. They're eating some of the debris or detritus, dung, and, and carrion. They're helping cycle nutrients in the system. And ways to identify flies is that they usually have short feathery antenna. So this is a, a fly that looks like a bee, but it's a fly and these large eyes that almost meet in the middle of their uh, head, one pair of wings, and then some short mouth parts. Beetles, again, here we see where the larvae are doing the beneficial insect service here by eating other insects. And the adults, however, need flowers. So the young are carnivores, the young are eating other insects, but the adults become vegetarian and they're just eating the, the nectar or pollen from flowers. Beetles are one of the most diverse groups of animals on the planet and they're pretty recognizable. They have that hard uh, top wing and really kind of opposing mouth parts or mandibles, long antenna, and then that, that top wing is armored looking. Wasps. Again, here we have the, the benefit of the adults feeding on pollen and nectar, and the young are often f um, fed prey by their mother who brings it back or lays the eggs on those larvae. Wasps can be identified by this narrow waist. Um, they're kind of long and linear usually. They also look hard or armored, and they aren't very hairy. So it can be smooth or shiny. Butterflies and moths, uh, for us in agriculture, often those larvae are our pest insects. Uh, but in the large diversity, of course, we have a lot of butterflies and moths that are rare or endangered insects. And, and here, here again, it's a case where the, the larvae are eating 
the roots or the larvae are vegetarian, they're eating the, the vegetation, leaves, roots, and then the, the adult butterflies or moths are feeding on, on flowers. True bugs is a group that undergoes incomplete metamorphosis. This is a page from the beneficial insect guide here. To give you a sense of that, I'm not sure how well you can read it, but it's, it shows you what the relative size of the adult is, how to identify it. These are generalist predators. Common prey are caterpillars, aphids, leaf hoppers, uh, leaf beetles, thrips, spider mites, and uh, other eggs, insect eggs. And um, what they need for habitat, uh, crop, de crop debris, mulch, or, or brush piles. So that's, again, just to introduce a little bit about the true bugs and give you a taste of, of what information is in this book. Of all those pollinating insects, though, bees are the most important, and that's because both the, the young, the, the adult workers or queens, which are out visiting flowers, they carry pollen back to the nest where the larvae are, and they feed pollen and nectar balls, it can be called bee bread, uh, they feed that to the larva. So bees are really actively seeking out pollen because they feed on pollen and nectar, and then they're bringing that back to the nest for their young. Can, can anyone recognize the flower pictured here? Tomato. Mm -hmm. So tomatoes, I know they're grown somewhat in Ohio, but you're not the farmers that are growing tomatoes, it sounds like. But bumblebees, tomatoes have a special kind of of anthers that require buzz pollination, and bumblebees are large enough bees, and they actually can hold on to the flower. They change the way they use their wing muscles, and instead of using those muscles to fly, they just vibrate their body. And the frequency that they vibrate at actually releases the pollen from the anthers of the tomato. So whether you're a home gardener who wants to get a lot of tomatoes, or a tomato producer, uh, creating good habitat and practices for bumblebees is really helpful. Honeybees also are, of course, a prominent pollinator, but they are from Europe, and they're really a, another kind of livestock, if you want to think of them that way, because humans manage them, and we're using them for certain purposes. Uh, but in a lot of ways, they're affected by the same kinds of things as the insects that are in the wild. Um, in terms of, of pesticides and having the right food resources for them. Hmm, sorry, that one's not displaying either. But <laughs> um, we have over 4,000 species of native bees in North America. And this is a picture. This is just like the forehead of a really large bee with one of the smallest bees next to it for comparison. And then... Um, this figure, when it's clear, this whole circle is showing the main groups of types of bees and how many species are in each. This little sliver here shows we have about 50 bumblebee species and one honeybee. So I think honeybees and bumblebees are the ones we're most familiar with. But if you look at all the bee diversity, they're just a tiny fraction of the bees that are out there. So the, the key characteristics, again, instead of a fly that has two wings, bees will have four wings. The females have, um, they're carrying pollen, and because of that, they're usually hairy because those hairs help to carry the pollen. And they'll have smaller eyes that are on the side of their head instead of the large uh, eyes that meet in the middle like flies do. And this shows another way of looking at different bee groups. So some of them are, are uh, carry the pollen on their legs, like honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, and mining bees. Others are designed so that they carry pollen on the abdomen. Those are the leaf cutter bees and the mason bees. And then there are some bees that, that um, break the rules. They don't gather pollen because they are actually parasites on other bees. They lay their eggs in another bee species' nest, and they fool that bee into feeding 
uh, its young. So they're called cuckoo bees because the, the cuckoo as a bird does that as well. The cuckoo bird lays its neg- eggs in other birds' nests and the other bird feeds them. And there are some bees that have that same parasitic behavior as well. And then sort of tied with that, there are different types of societies for bees. So of course we know of honeybees as social. They live in large colonies with different types of workers and and queens and drones. The bumblebees are also like that. And then there's sort of a whole series of um, a a continuum of society types here. Gregarious, each queen has her own nest, but the nests are near to each other. And then Uh, Solitary is where most of our our native bees, um, the the type of society that they have, they're they're solitary. So most of these are ground nesting, and that's where this ties into cover cropping a lot because they are living in the ground, so we need to be aware of tillage practices. Another 30% nest in stems or tunnels or hollow twigs, and then... Uh, Bumblebees actually, they have their nests underground, but they don't dig their own nests or tunnels. They use existing tunnels of rodents or, um, you know, other burrowing animals that have already excavated the tunnel. Bumblebees use that for their nest. So I'm just going to, these are just some slides showing some of that. Behavior And here, for example, is the tunnel nesting bee that's in a hollow stem. And the queen or the mother has gathered pollen and nectar together into this mass and then laid an egg on it and then selled, or closed that off with either leaves or mud and then done it again and done it again and done it again. And as each of those feed and then hatch, they'll chew their way out of that. So because a lot of these wild bees are in the soil, uh, they, they need some both nesting structure and then where they overwinter is usually different from where they nest. So they're nesting and raising young each growing season in the soil, but when they're overwintering, they're often in the thatch or, or duff or leafy matter. And native bees uh, face another risk because they're solitary. If that one nest or that one queen when she's out foraging is, is killed or destroyed, then that whole colony is gone. It's not like a honeybee colony that has tens of thousands of workers and can hatch a new queen. Um, so that's something that makes all of our solitary bees more vulnerable. So habitat requirements. Pollinators need flowers all season long. They're, he- they're here all season. Uh, they need to feed their young the pollen. And, um, and then so it, from early spring until late un- until frost, it's important to have those flower resources on the farm. Places like this, brush piles, um, it's just, again, instead of making things cleaner, make them messier. So leave windbreaks, leave leaf litter, leave some undisturbed soil, uh, unmown grassy borders, hollow stems, brush piles. That, that's all providing the shelter, whether it's for nesting or for overwintering for the beneficial insects. Then um, this is cut off as well, but um, pollinators and beneficial insects need grasses as well. So really focused you know, on, of course, what they're feeding on are the flowers, but in terms of, of protection and overwintering, grasses are pollinator-friendly plants as well. So don't forget that when you're designing a, a pollinator planting mix. And, and also areas like this, if you just have rocks, um, those rock piles create a lot of bare soil that's protected from tillage. Um, and so those are, you can see those as insect habitat as well. Okay, here's just a, a break here. If anyone has any, any questions at this point. Uh-huh. Okay, so the question was if they're putting a, a CRP border, what are some good wildflowers for that? And then what are some good 
insects for pollinating soybeans, right? So um, I'm not going to go into it in this program, but if you talk to your NRCS office, there are many different Farm Bill programs that will cover that, and they have a, a list of flowers to use to, um, to meet the requirements of that program. What's important is, is early season to late season. And you have to also try to manage cost. So Golden Alexanders is one of our native wildflowers. It's in the carrot family, and it's one of the earliest flowering wildflowers that's also affordable, and that will grow well in a CRP mix. Um, the, I have purple prairie clover as a photo. A lot of our native sunflowers are good. Um, and then later in the season, many kinds of asters are, are helpful. They'll be blooming all the way in, until frost. And then uh, insects that are good at pollinating soybeans, many, many of these solitary bees and these other flies will be visiting soybeans. I don't have one specific insect to say, um, but with, with so many tiny bees and tiny flies uh, and medium-sized ones, those are ones that having habitat can help increase your soybean pollination. Any other questions right now? Mm -hmm. Would you give a little discussion on your Roundup slide? It mm -hmm. appeared that the uh, use of Roundup has just soared. Is your research showing that it exceeds the recommend the uh, uh, labeling, uh, the maximum labeled amount per acre? And is the Roundup itself damaging, or is a uh, lack of habitat from the Roundup kill right. damaging? That's a good. That's a good question. It's not. That's not not my research, and so I would have to go back and look at that original publication. I don't believe, I'm not sure if those rates are exceeding the recommended rates. That was showing pounds per square mile. Um, and then the issue with, with Roundup or other herbicides, right, often what the impact for beneficial insects or pollinators is, is that you're removing the plants that they're feeding off of, the flowers, that provide the nectar and pollen. There also is more growing evidence that herbicides have an indirect, uh, again, it's non-lethal, uh, but insects that are exposed to herbicides actually become weaker or sicker, and that's because just like we have microbes, beneficial microbes that help us with our digestion, insects have digestive systems with microbes in them as well. And this is some new research that's coming out. It's been done on honeybees, but it's shown that it's actually the honeybee larva. Their digestive systems are impacted. Um, the, the beneficial microbes in their digestive systems are negatively impacted by glyphosate, for example. Um, so that's really an area of, of new research showing how you know, you wouldn't think that an herbicide would impact an insect directly like that, but it can. And there's also some negative interactions between fungicides and pesticides. Again, a lot of these are non-lethal. They don't kill the insects, but they either reduce their uh, reproductive capacity or make them poorer at foraging um, and are, are just, in general, weakening the individuals and populations. Let's talk a little bit more about habitat and looking at what we can do with, with cover crops. So, again, providing habitat for pollinators and beneficial insects can provide critical ecosystem services to our, our cropped areas. And the amount of natural habitat has a direct influence on pollinator and beneficial insect diversity and abundance. What, what a bug needs, so I think we tried to cover this now, but bees need pollen and nectar throughout their life cycles. Other beneficial insects reply, re, rely on pollen or nectar to supplement their diet or as a sole food source, food source at specific points in their life cycle. And an abundance of floral resources from spring through fall is needed to support diverse insect populations. It's, yeah, I'll, okay. 
And also, a lot of these practices are complementary. So practices to support pollinators and support pest predators and parasitoids uh, involve IPM, reduce the input of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And again, going back to what James was saying, really look at neonicotinoid use. Look at your thresholds um, and, and really try not to, to treat unless you absolutely have to. This is um, showing a cover crop in an almond orchard in, in California, but what the text says is true, text says is true for anywhere. There's some limitations of traditional uh, cover crops. They have a limited bloom season, usually in early spring. Uh, and a lot of non-native plants have limited attractiveness to native insects. So something we can do here in the Midwest, again, is try to um, stagger different parts of the farm, use different cover crops at different times. Or if we look at buckwheat and soybeans, can you sequentially plant the buckwheat and also sequentially terminate it so that you've sort of artificially extended the bloom period? Each strip is, is still only blooming for maybe a week or a few weeks, but if you have multiple strips at different ages across your, your farm landscape, you can be supporting uh, the habitat needs of those insects over a, a longer window. So terminate as late in the season as possible to extend the bloom and mow instead of till to minimize disturbance and maximize uh, reseeding and when you want that. If you do need to spray, uh, one thing you can do is mow the flowers first so that then when you do spray the crop or the cover crop area, the insects are not actively there foraging. But mow, you know, um, just mow the flowers off to avoid killing the beneficial insects. Xerces, we also have some, some beneficial insect scouting guides, both looking for them on flowers, looking for them on the foliage, and looking for them in the soil. You can get these on the website. And that help you, helps you through these key steps of recognizing what beneficial insects and habitat already exist on your farm, and then how to protect those habitats, and some ideas for how to create additional habitat. Let's see, these are not, not displaying so well here. So if we look at some of the common cover crops, and then more for specialty farmers, you can start to use some of our culinary herbs and actually harvest those as a, a second crop from your farm. So basil, borage, dill, cilantro, the mints, those are excellent at supporting beneficial insects and they can actually be a cash crop in and of themselves as well. And then uh, in addition to a lot of the, the common legumes and grasses that we use, buckwheat and phacelia, and then also sunflower, um, these become a little bit more expensive, but that creates a nice diversity of, of flowers for us. This is a native annual called partridge pea, and you can use that in rotation with our annual crops here in the Midwest as well. And it has the same type of pollination syndrome as I described with the tomato, so the anthers are there, and the, here's a bumblebee grabbing onto there, and it's going to vibrate those uh, anthers and get the pollen that way. This is, again, covering a lot of those herbs that I talked about. So your home garden, if your home is also on your farm, planting just more of these in your, in your yard or garden can support beneficial insects as well. Here's an assassin bug uh, on a fennel or dill flower. And here's a study from France that Facilia, buckwheat, and dill were the best for increasing hoverfly of a position success for, for pest control. So again, here are just some species that are already commonly used as cover crops and a, a few additional ones which may or may not work for the climate here, um, but are other ones to consider adding for diversity. Here's an example of, of using some insectary strips in more vegetable production here 
with buckwheat and winter rye between the cash vegetable crops. And this, this is a type of practice that's also called beetle banking. Let's see if, if a picture, a picture is here, but, but either strips in our corn and soybean fields, they could be along the edges, but this is another example of like what you were saying with uh, a CRP or a perennial grass habitat. That, that provides cover for all those beneficial beetles to spend the winter and then move into the field during the, the crop season. Here's the, the message again. So try to let some of those early season cover crops flower as late, or let them go to flowering, um, because this is especially critical for a lot of our bee species. So where, where possible, wait until it's past peak bloom. If you cannot wait until past peak bloom, consider leaving some strips of the cover crop standing to prevent crash of the beneficial insect populations. With buckwheat, for example, if you stagger the planting and you stagger the mowing row by row, you can lengthen the bloom period but still prevent the buckwheat from reseeding. It's also important to terminate with as little physical disturbance as possible. So for example, roller crimping may be less disruptive to pollinator nests in the soil than, than cultivation is. It's important to maintain permanent conservation areas on the farm to sustain beneficial insects in the absence of the cover crop. And this is not just flowers, but, but all those um, predatory insects, there's the time when the pest is in the crop but when the crop doesn't have a pest, those, those predators still need to be eating something else. So having uh, alternative pests in other habitat is important to maintain. Leave as much cover crop residue as possible to protect beneficial insect eggs and any hibernating adults. And minimize insecticide use in the cash crops that follow cover crops to avoid harm to beneficial insects that may still be nesting in the crop residue. At a minimum, you should follow a comprehensive integrated pest management plan that, that includes specific risk mitigation strategies that protect pollinators and beneficial insects. So don't kill what you've been working to build. Um, again, maybe you may need to use neonic treated corn seed, but if you can avoid it with soybeans, that's another season where you're giving uh, the, the soil and all the organisms in it a break from pesticide. Leaving some areas unmown, so weeds or natural habitat that's left unmown provides valuable flowers for pollinators, predators, and parasitoids, and, and also that, that shelter and overwintering habitat. This is just um, a type of Lespedeza here growing on, on the margin. And when you zoom in on that photo, look at all these bees that are packed in there. <laughs> Just, uh, it's probably a cold morning where they're waiting to, for the sun to come out a little bit more and they can get going. This, I think, um, I've covered. So really consider the, the practices of either pesticides, herbicides, or insecticides on your farm and how they may be impacting these. Um, You'll certainly have a lot more pollinators in a planting like this where there are flowers. You can use grass only strips as, as a buffer. You'll still have insects in that grass, but you'll have fewer pollinators. So consider the ways that you can integrate grass strips as pesticide buffers on your farm as well. Here are a few more resources from, from Xerces on protecting the existing habitat from pesticides. And this is always um, something I like to revisit again. Pests are gonna thrive in monocultures. If the only thing in your field is corn, well, only things that eat corn are going, the only insects that eat corn are gonna be out there, right? So uh, again, beneficial insects need more. You need diversity of habitats over the seasons and also uh, all the food sources, whether it's the f from flowers or from alternate pests during different types of the year. 
And just to get us out of Midwestern winter for a moment here, um, I'm going to jump us over to Spain. This is some, some research that I did on, on cover crops there. And again, they've, they've gone into a lot of monoculture farming and intensified farming. This is what a typical young olive orchard looks like there. It's bare soil, and that's maintained through tillage or herbiciding and um, water. Water competition is the main concern and reason for doing that. But there are also a lot of green farmers who are integrating uh, cover crops or flowering understories into their orchards. One of the big pests for olives is a fly, the olive fly, and that will lay its egg inside the developing fruit. And it, it's not just cosmetic damage, it reduces both um, the quality of table olives as well as the oil um, yield and the oil, oil quality. So having a lot of these flowering understories helps maintain the beneficial insect populations that control the olive fly pest. And this is, is not Photoshop, this is a lane. Um, one farmer owns the trees on this side and he's managing it in a conventional way with nothing in the understory and another farmer has planted um, the understory, the flowering understory and then these are some shrubs for a hedgerow that are in these tree tubes here. And just walking there, just the bird song, like the, the way you could hear a difference in how much life was in the olive, olive orchard on the right compared to the olive orchard on the left was really telling. And of course there's all, all the insects and all the things you can't necessarily hear uh, were there also. These are some examples of integrating insect habitat on a farm. These are from Minnesota. So if you have fallow areas, you can do native wildflower plantings. You can also create some pollinator strips or insectary strips through some of the, the annual or, or here's an alfalfa or pasture field with a strip through it. This farm has uh, integrated some, some coniferous hedges to help protect from pesticides, maybe from the neighboring fields. And they put in some some flowering hedgerows, so specific shrubs um, that, that bloom early in the year there. And then where they, they do have cropping in the, the fields, they're using cover crops. Some of their crops themselves here are providing resources for beneficial insects because they're cut flowers and herbs. And where they have uh, um, some woods on their property, they're also trying to keep that um, diverse and keep the dead wood in place there. And this is a, a, a nice story. Um, this couple has an orchard in Minnesota and because they really rely on bees for pollination of their crop, the farmer was really looking at the insects there and getting to know all the different bees that were visiting the flowers. And this is Bombus aphanus, which is the rusty patch bumblebee. So they discovered that they had this federally endangered bee on their farm. And they um, took the opportunity then to plant some permanent habitat there. And this is a, a sequence showing how they did that. They had sort of a field, I think, full of maybe Queen Anne's lace to begin with. Um, the following summer, they planted buckwheat as a smother crop to prepare this area. And then that fall, they had the, the area was tilled and seeded with a diverse wildflower mix. And then uh, two years later, they had a lot of these native wildflowers growing there and supporting um, this bee, not just when their apples are blooming, but all throughout the bee's life cycle. So again, to summarize, diversity brings more diversity. Beneficial insects need to have their needs met, needs met for every stage and every season. It's critical to protect the habitat and the insects from pesticides. And part of what we can do for, for them here in our annual crops is to create and maintain permanent habitat that complements the cover crops. Again, here's, here's the, the website and the email if you're interested in contacting us to receive these publications. And in the, in the future, maybe next year at this conference, if James will have me back, I could focus a little bit more on, on soil 
invertebrates and how we can manage for them. Xerces is a uh, donor-based organization, so you can become a member if you enjoy what you've learned today and want to support insect conservation. We also want to thank a lot of our, our corporate sponsors. I'm doing a lot of work in the Northern Great Plains in Manitoba right now um, through Cheerios and working with farmers who grow oats for Cheerios and integrating pollinator and beneficial insect habitat on their farms. And uh, we're, we're integrated with a lot of other scientists and researchers and, and farmers. So.